Today we're going to be returning back to the beginning, full circle uh, in our series on, on these core beliefs, these things that we say, this is the foundation of what we're about. We've been doing it to, on and off uh, over the last few months. That we've had nine so far. We're going to have a recap, uh, test our knowledge, see how much we can remember, um, but also look at one last fundamental that I think ties it all together uh, and makes it make sense. Uh, we started the series saying that there are many things that you can believe as a Christian. And in your life, perhaps you've been to different churches and there are different nuances, different beliefs, different things that are held, different things that are practiced. Uh, They stand up at different times, they sit down at different times, they dress differently, they behave differently, uh, they act differently. Uh, There are lots of things that that are different, uh, but they're all wrong, aren't they? (laughs) Except Except for none of them. They're all wrong in some way. Every church gets something wrong. Not every church has a monopoly on the truth. But hopefully what happens is they aren't wrong about the fundamental things. Uh, That we have differences. Some are cultural. Some are traditional. Some are just comfortable. Some things are fashionable. uh, Some things are harmful and we want to avoid those. But what we've tried to do in this series is boil down what is essential. What is at the heart? What is it that we hold to? What is it that we stand firm on? And to be honest, it's been, the challenge hasn't been trying to find things to talk about. The challenge has been trying to boil it down to what is at the core. There is so much, and each one spirals off into a hundred different topics, uh, and we've had to avoid some things, and I've purposely tried not to go down different rabbit holes because we're trying to get to what is at the core. And you can be the judge of how successful we've been in doing that but this week we're going to look at uh, another essential, uh, and, and really the whole process is that. It's kind of go, what, what is it that I want to hold to? Um, it's a bit like Christmas, when you're little, um, Christmas, the thing that would ruin Christmas more than anything is if you don't get the Hot Wheels track that you wanted, or you don't get the doll you wanted, or you don't get the, the, the shop that you wanted, or the toy shop, or anything like that. That would be the end of the world. And as you grow up, you mature, your tastes mature a bit, and it's, if I don't get that perfume, or that handbag, or that golf club, then Christmas would be ruined. And some of you will be at the stage where you don't even worry about that anymore, because you buy your own presents, so you won't be disappointed, and then the other person pays for it, but you buy it for yourself. But then you, perhaps you get to a stage where you realise, you know what, it's not even about what I get. As long as I'm with those who love me, then that's all that matters. See, it's not about adding more and adding more. The process of growing up is actually boiling it down to, oh, this is the thing that matters most. This is what we're about. This is where I can plant my feet. So really, we've been working through something called the creed. We've just sung it, in fact. Uh, That's what that song's called. I think my clicker's playing. Oh, no, we're... We're back. There you go. Very small writing. That's the creed. Um, We're going to break it down in a moment. But it's the Apostles' Creed. It's a few thousand years old. It's a statement the early church put together to say, this is fundamental. These are the things that we hold to. And for a few thousand years, every church, every church that can call itself church, has stood on this and said, this is what unites us. And there are some that spiraled off and changed bits, and they've been recognized as as other other things other than the church. But anything that says we are Jesus' church... This has been what's united them. And we've been working through it, going through scripture at the same time as we do it. So here's our recap. Um, as a reminder, our top ten. No. Jackie, would you better press a button for me? Number one, Jesus is God's son and our king. It's the statement Jesus says to Peter, I am the Christ. And on this foundation, I will build my church. The creed says, I believe in Jesus Christ. We've just sung it. God's only son, our Lord, this is the, the, the starting statement. Any church as a church says Jesus is the Christ. It's the rock solid foundation. It's the thing on which the church is built. And that was our starter. He's God's son, uh, the one who was sent uh, to be the Messiah, the rescuer, the one who would restore God's good creation. So that's number one, nice and simple. Number two was, drum roll, God is our creator and our father. The creed says, I believe in God, the father almighty creator of heaven and earth. Like I said, there's loads of things you can spiral out of that. Loads of nuances and how it happened and why it happened and where it happened and when it happened. But the foundation, God is our creator and our father. That Jesus introduces this idea that God, this God who is beyond us and outside of us. And you remember, it was very confusing. We talked about that God, God isn't a thing, just God is. It's so beyond us, we can't even get our heads around it. And yet, he's farther, he's close, and he's near. And that, that, that distance, that those two ideas, the creator who's beyond creation and the father who is near, both are summed up uh, in what Jesus reveals about God. So that was our number two. Number three was Jesus came to reveal, demonstrate, and illustrate what God is like. 
Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, that when we see Jesus, we see the clearest picture of God. Hebrews says God spoke in many ways, but he spoke most clearly in Jesus. He is the one who, who reveals most clearly that when you see him, Jesus says, you see the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is in me. Uh, and remember the flower pots, God is in me and I'm in him. And, and that, that doesn't quite make sense. But Jesus says that you have to understand when you think of God, I am now the picture. I am now the, the one who shows you. I am now your understanding of what God is like. That was number three. Number four was Jesus defines sin as anything that harms harms you, sorry, that should be, harms others or harms your walk with God. Jesus gives these two great commands. You love God and you love others as you love yourself. That, that, that there is this problem in the world. There is this sin, this darkness. It's anti-love. It's anti-light. It's anti-life. And anything that, that isn't light, that isn't truth, is sin. Anything that isn't love, that is hate or, or apathy, that is sin. And anything that doesn't lead to life but death, that is sin. And it's an infection and we all suffer with it and we're all infected by it. And we also do it to others. We do it to ourselves. We do it to God. And it's this problem that seeps into everything. We need forgiveness for it. We need a new body for it. It's not just something that we can get rid of. It's a new life that's needed. And we need everlasting life to, to solve this problem, a connection with God. That life everlasting isn't heaven, eating chocolate and not getting fat for the rest of your life. Life everlasting, Jesus says, is knowing God. is being connected to him because he is the source of life and love and light. And only in connection to him do we find the solution to this sin that infects us. So that was number four. Number five, Jesus died and rose to reconcile you with God. You could preach the rest of your life sermons extrapolating from this and explaining and applying it. But Paul, as we've already looked at this morning, says, I want to remind you of the gospel. He died for our sin and was buried. He rose on the third day and was seen. The creed says he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried, descended to the dead. And on the third day, he rose again. The gospel that forgives us of sin, that reconciles us with God, that heals us and restores us, that sets up a new kingdom uh, in God's name and, and delivers us from our slavery. That Jesus, this gospel, this foundation, and like I said, there's so many ways to understand it. It's a diamond, Spurgeon said, that you look at from different angles and each one shines differently. But we spend our lives, every year we celebrate it, every Sunday we celebrate it. It's why we gather on a Sunday to be reminded he died for us and rose again and life is ours. So that's number five. And number six, Jesus is the righteous judge who promises justice and invites us to trust him in the meantime. And you can talk about this in different ways. You can talk about paradise and Gehenna or heaven and hell or all these things, but it all comes down to Jesus is going to make everything right. He is a just judge. He is good and he is faithful. He will bring justice. And we always think of justice in the negative. If someone's brought to justice, it means they're in trouble. But in the Bible, justice is God making everything good and right. Not just punishing, not just the, the bad things, but also bringing what is good and life-giving and fruitful, making sure that thrives. And we get to trust him because in the meantime, that doesn't happen. So we trust him until that day comes. And in this life, sometimes we just don't see it. We don't get the justice we long for. And everyone longs for it. We don't get the, the, the righteousness that our heart cries out for. We don't get things working together and working properly as we want. But there is a time when that will happen. And we're invited to trust him because he is the just one who will make it so. So it says in the creed, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. But he will come with justice one more, one more time. And we trust him to do that. So that was number six. Number seven, the Holy Spirit is God with us and in us to unite us. They get wordy as they go on, don't they? To unite us with Jesus and others, make us more like Jesus and empower us to live like Jesus. We said at the time there's never been a controversy about the Holy Spirit, so you don't have to dwell on it too long. Um, there are lots of things you could say, but here it is. Here's a foundation that I think most of us can go, yep, I get it. He's in us. He unites us with Jesus, makes us more like him and empowers us to live like him. That This is God's gift, his spirit within us. We believe the creed simply just says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. This gift of God to, to dwell in us, that we're united with him. Christ in God, God in Christ, Christ in us. This hope that we have. Uh, that's number seven. Number eight, 
the church is Christ's body and God's means of personal, cultural and global transformation. That that's what we are, we're Christ's body, that we're united, he is the head and everything comes from him. He is the chief shepherd, he is the foundation stone, the cornerstone of the church and that we are built upon. Everyone having a part, everyone having a role, everyone being connected, one with God and then with each other in this place. And it, this thing has transformed lives, it transformed my life, it's transformed yours, it transforms cultures changes the world and one day we're told also is involved in in the judging of the living and the dead i didn't quite quite, that's that's not fundamental because i don't know how that works or why what job i'm going to have or what i'm going to judge but the idea the church is going to be involved in some way so we believe the creed often says the uh, um, the holy catholic church um, not catholic church it's sort of the idea universal is what catholic means this universal church the communion of saints not just lempster baptist church but everyone who calls on the name of jesus Um, So that's number eight. Number nine, last one. The Bible is a God-breathed story that witnesses to God's redemptive activity in the world, culminating in the arrival of his final and forever king. This scripture we have is this witness, this testimony of what God has done and who he is, um, recorded over thousands of years by many different authors, breathed by the Holy Spirit, that culminates in Jesus. You don't understand scripture unless you see it leading to Jesus. And Jesus says this, you can't, there's nothing in it. You don't, if you don't come to me to find life. So there we go. How many did you remember? <laughs> these fundamentally, these found, like I said, and there's so much more. <laughs> That's the problem. There is so much more that we could add to it. But we're on number 10. And number 10 is this. None of these things matter. <laughs> None of them. They're all useless. They're all meaningless. They're all empty and hollow. Jackie, next slide quickly. Unless... <laughs> Unless, and that's what we're going to explore today. Why are they not meaningless? Why is there an unless? What is it that makes these things real? To do that, we're going to be in the book of James to start with. We're going to go to other places as well. But Jackie, if you'd be able to just click us on to to James, and we'll read that together. Because James talks about this problem. This idea, these are our beliefs. These are the things we hold to be true, that we put our faith in, our trust in. Um, But there is a problem built into this that James addresses. What does it profit, he asked, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of of daily food, and any one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Stay on it a second, Jackie. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not, (laughs) if it does not have works, is dead. James highlights this problem. This problem that you can believe all these things, but there is a need for these things or or a necessity for these things to work themselves out in some way. And so he talks about this this person, a brother or sister who comes destitute and desperate, needing help. And and if you go, well, go, be blessed, be well fed, but you do nothing to help. He says, what is that about? You, You have all these beliefs, but they don't seem to be impacting the way that you live. Now, just think about it for a moment. Someone who's destitute, suffering. Just go back a second, Jackie. Um, Destitute, being not warm, be filled, they're hungry. There are loads of beliefs that underpin this. One is, Jesus is my Lord. And Jesus is the Christ. And he says to love others as I love myself. So that's, that's that's our number one belief, do you remember? The other one is God is a creator. This person is made in the image of God, is precious and valued. We've not thought about that. So the way I treat them should flow from the idea that this person is precious and valued. What are the other ones? Um, Jesus is God. That Jesus revealed what God is like. And when Jesus comes, it's the destitute and the the oppressed that he seems to have the closest affinity with. If he is the clearest picture of God is like, then my treatment of them should reflect that too. That, That I have a gospel, that I am forgiven of sin, but I'm also provided with grace in abundance. And if that doesn't overflow to others, then where is it? Jesus is my judge and, and, and he's the one who makes everything right and good. And if I'm not in the process of making a problem right and good, then on what side am I of justice? That I have the Holy Spirit in me to equip me and enable me to love and to serve, to create the character of Christ, to do this and to serve this person. I'm part of a body that by myself I may not have the resources, but I'm part of a body that together we can do something and make a difference in this person's life. I have scripture, a story that talks about the poor and the suffering more than any other topic and those who are oppressed and the foreigner and how we treat them. And suddenly you see all these beliefs that we've talked about. 
They all have application. They all make a difference. And if I just say to this person, go be blessed, then what's happened to all nine of those things that I've just spent all these weeks talking about? What difference does all those things make if I, in the moment it doesn't work out in the way I treat someone? So James goes on and really drives it home. He goes on, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. That's okay, you, you, you believe it really well and I, I'll do it. And James says, well, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Those nine things we've just put on the, on the screen, Satan believes every single one of them. And he believes them better than you do. He knows God better than you do. He has better theology than anyone, in, anyone who's ever existed. He understands. He's seen it. He's stood in the presence of God. He knows it. He spent years studying it. He, he understands it more than any one of us. And he shudders. It's not just a head belief. He, he gets it. God is glorious and mighty. He is creator. That he is Lord. He is king. He has died and he has risen. That death will be defeated and Satan will be defeated. They shudder as they think about it. But it doesn't mean anything. It's all meaningless. Unless. Unless what? James goes on to explain. You foolish person, he says. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our faith, Father, there is the word, it's useless. Was not our faith that Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. It's useless unless our faith is completed. And it's completed when our faith is lived out in a walk with Jesus. That's the, that's the thing that the scripture again and again, and, and people often accuse James of being out of sync with the others because we say, well, what's needed by the gospel? The gospel requires faith and repentance. That's all it requires of us. That it, it asks us to believe and to turn away, to trust in Jesus. That's what it requires. But what it produces is the fruit, is the works. It's where religion often gets it wrong. I think it might be my next slide, Jackie. If I'm, oh no, go on. And again, oh sorry, oh, okay, we're all over the place. Anyway, the, the scripture is, James isn't out of sync, he's in step with the rest of scripture. So that verse, go on Jackie, back onto Romans. Um, in Romans, which is the book that most people think is the most head knowledge, the most theology, the book of Romans is, has bookends on it. In the very first verses it says, Paul's role and his calling is to call the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. That's his whole point. So all the theology, all the thinking, it all leads to an obedience that comes from faith. And at the very end of the book, just to remind us, in case we missed it at the start, he says that the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. It's not just about what you believe. It's not about saying the right things. It's an obedience that flows from what we believe. It's a walk with Jesus that flows from these nine things and many others that we hold to be true. That's the calling. That's the requirement and anything outside of that is, is, is the same level as Satan. And just so you know, that's not a good comparison to be making. I want to be above that. I want to be beyond that. And if we don't live out this obedience to the faith, then it means nothing. Now, we can get this wrong. If you want to go on, Jackie, often what we do is we say, well, we have to be good and then we get salvation. That's the, that's the mistake we make. Well, then I better start behaving myself. Better start acting right, talking right, behaving right, doing the right thing so that I can be accepted. But that isn't what it's about. Go back, Jackie. <laughs> um, it, it's not. It's, it, it's this something that it produces. It creates. It flows from it. I, I believe and I trust and I'm saved. And now being saved, it flows into a walk. It enables me. It produces in me this obedience. It produces in me this life. And James says, if you haven't got that, then, then there should be a question mark. Now, we all falter, we all stumble, we all don't obey perfectly. And I don't know what the level is of how much you need, but that's kind of the wrong question to be asking. It's not what's the minimum I can get away with. But has this faith, has this salvation taken such a hold? Have I given enough of myself to Jesus that it's working itself out in a life that produces fruit? Fruit that others should be able to see. It's not enough for me to say, well, I know I'm a good person, even though everyone else thinks I'm a jerk. I, I know I, I, it's fruit that others taste and they see the goodness of God and his work in my life. They see the, the, the change that he's doing. It's not just enough to hear, which is where the, I want to teach you three words 
um, in the Old Testament that, that, that shape this. The first, Jackie, is the word for hear. You can hear something. The word for that is the word shema. Okay? So you shema something. So often it, the, the prayer that Israel prayed, shema, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. You need to hear something. Hear it preached. Hear it taught. Read it. Uh, you need to hear this truth. The next word that we're going to learn is the word for, for to, to listen. Well, if you've been in any kind of relationship, marriage, children, whatever, you know there's a difference between hearing and listening. Um, and the word for listen in the Hebrew is the word shema. Same word. Not two different words, the same word. To hear something and then to take heed of it, to listen to it, so that you go, oh, I get it. I, I, I understand it. I, I'm, I'm believing it now. I'm not just hearing something in, it, in one ear and out the other. I'm listening to it. Third word we're going to learn is the word obey, which in Hebrew is the word Shema. To obey it, to not just hear it, but to act on what you've heard, to respond to it. It's the same word. It's this concept that we don't, because we separate them out. But in their mindset, it's all the same. If you haven't shamaed it, obeyed it, then you haven't listened. And if you haven't listened, you haven't heard. And the opposite is true. To hear it, you have to have listened to it and obeyed it. If you only get halfway along, you haven't really shamaed. You've only done part of the process. But all of it, so that song we sing, trust and obey, for there's no other way. In Hebrew it would be Shema, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus than to Shema. That's it, it's trusting, it's listening, it's obeying, it's all these things in one. And that's what we're called to, to Shema to God, to Shema to the good news, to Shema these truths that we don't just hear them and nod along. We don't just listen to them and believe them in our heads, but that they work themselves out. Now let me just say, this is really, really hard. Doing this, living out this, this, this life that, that Jesus calls us to, living out the implications of these beliefs is incredibly difficult. But I've got some good news. There are some workarounds that we can do to get ourselves out of the problem. The first is that we can distract ourselves. You might have to click on a few, Jackie. I don't know where we are now. Keep going. I've done that. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. Works. For, that's it. Trust, salvation, works. You've got it. Don't worry. Keep going. What's this next one? Here we go. The first is we can distract ourselves. Scripture talks about this. In Timothy, it says, As I urged you, Timothy, when I went to Macedonia, this is Paul writing to a younger pastor, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. In that, that time, there was this group that loved a genealogy. Maybe you do, maybe family history and all these things. Uh, but they loved uh, the, the genealogies of scripture and trying to work out who was related to who and, and myths that had grown up. Basically, they were distracting themselves with useless things, meaningless things that promoted, he says, controversial speculation rather than advancing God's work. And in Christianity, there are plenty of things to distract you. There are charts and there are graphs and there are timelines and there are all sorts of things. There are genealogies, tons of things that you can get sucked into and you can spend the rest of your life devoted to. And Paul may well just be one who would write a letter and say, you know what, they're, they're fine in and of themselves, but if they provoke controversial speculation and they're not advancing God's work, then all you're doing is distracting yourself. All you're doing is going after something where you have all you need. Or you're not living it out. It's not God's work. It's simply something to keep you from it. In 2 Timothy, he says this, and this is really powerful. In 2 Timothy, which is the next one, he says, There will be people who are always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And I know this is someone who's studied and got degrees in theology. It is possible to be always learning more theology, more teaching, more understanding, more, get, get more Bible study and more prayer. And it, I know that sounds odd to be against that, but there's a way that we can do these things where we're always learning, but you never get to a knowledge of the truth. See, the truth is, and we have to often remind ourselves of this, you have heard more sermons than the early church ever did. You have more access to scripture than the early church ever did. You have more studies online and, and notes and, and access to things that, than they ever had. And yet I want to do just a quick comparison of how we're doing, sharing the gospel, loving those around us, making an impact in our culture and in our time. Always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. There is a danger that we can distract ourselves with more. And that's fine if that's your thing. You can always learn more. 
But if it never leads to a knowledge of the truth, and that's just not more knowledge, that's a, a lived knowledge. That's a mature knowledge. That's something that's been worked out, the truth, as you live it in your life. I'll give you an example. You could tell me all about forgiveness. You could tell me all the Greek words that mean forgiveness. You could explain to me the sacrificial system, how the birds and the goats and the flower and all the things meant that the people could be forgiven in the Old Testament. You could explain the ark and its images and its symbolism. You could explain the significance of blood and how it covers. You could explain propitiation and expiation and atonement and the scapegoat and all that that meant. And all the theories and the Latin words and Christ as victor and penal substitutionary atonement. You can explain all of that. But when your husband offends you and you don't forgive them, you've yet to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. You can explain creation. And you could explain all the, the Hebrew of every word in all six days and the exact sequence of how it happened. And you can pull apart science or show how it's compatible. And you can look at fossil records and, and you can do all these things. But if I asked you, did you sleep well last night? Trusting that your creator holds you in his hands. Because you can have all this knowing, but without a knowledge, a deep knowledge that goes, I rest in the hands of my Father, and I'm at peace because he holds me. That's a knowledge of the truth. You can be always learning, but never come to a knowledge of the truth. And I imagine, I was trying to work this out, I wonder, it'll probably take you a year or two, maybe less, you're clever people, to know everything that you need to know. And then it just takes the rest of your life for that to seep down, to that affect you for that to come out in the different circumstances that we face. And it doesn't mean you don't need reminding, and we don't keep learning and reading to be reminded and taught these things. But most of us know everything we need to do, know, know and to do. And it's about it affecting us, maturing us, deepening us. Otherwise, we'll say about ourselves, I was always learning, but never came to a knowledge of the truth. At the deacons meeting a few weeks ago, I, I was going through the letters to the Church of Revelation, we did Thyatira, that's a doozy, that one. <laughs> we were having a go at them. And one of the things he says is, there are these people who have learnt the so-called deep secrets of Satan. I thought, wow, what a, what a statement. This idea, oh, we just need, I want deep teaching. Not Dean in this superficial, fluffy stuff. We want deep teaching. And Thyatira goes, so Satan's so-called deep teaching. That this stuff that keeps it, that, oh, there's a secret level. There's another level that you haven't reached and we're up here and you're down there. No, there are ordinary Christians and that's it. There are no super apostles. There's just us. No one at a higher level, no one better. This is who we are. No so-called deep secrets. Just knowing it and then living it out. So you can do that if you find it too hard, just distract yourself. There's plenty of ways to do that. The other way is that you just give up. Just get, don't, don't work harder, just don't work. Timothy says this, he says, you've carefully followed my doctrine, so doctrine is important, but then he says, you've also followed my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, what happened to me at Antioch and Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, because in this series, I imagine some of you have been gone, I can't wait for this to finish, because it's all very heady, it's all very wordy, it's all kind of Dean just talking about stuff, but what about life? And I've got good news for you, because Paul says, you know, doctrine is important, we want to watch that. But some of you, don't give up, because the way you live demonstrates this more than any sermon I could ever preach. The way you interact and treat people preaches louder than I ever could. Your manner of life, your purpose, your faith, the way you have suffered and endured, your love, the way you persevere, the way you've been persecuted, your afflictions, all that has happened to you preaches the truth that I've tried to explain with words but you do with actions but don't give up because you don't understand the words you believe it more than most don't give up because you, don't, you can't explain it in the same way or you can't list all these things and you forgot eight of the nine things that were up there your life demonstrates it don't give up because you are living this faith and it is powerful and it is beautiful and it's exactly what Jesus invites us to don't give up you have preached more sermons, more, more understanding in the way you've treated others than most preachers ever will. This is, this is why these things are useless. Because they don't mean anything until they are lived out. And when you go to the Gospels, what you find is they are incredibly, you'll be overwhelmed with it, they're incredibly relational. 
And Jesus has a word, two words that he says more than any other when he meets people for the first time. We often think it's believe me or believe in me. If we believe in Jesus, that's it. But 20 times throughout the gospel, Jesus says, follow me. Not believe in me, not trust me, although we can do that, but follow me. Because in following, we learn to trust. And in following, we learn not just to trust, but to hear. And in following, we learn not just to trust and to hear, but to imitate, to obey. And we do it with him by our side. That's why the last fundamental, the thing that Satan doesn't have, although he's got all the other nine, is a walk with Jesus. And that's what we do. We follow him. And as we live our lives as Christians, what we're doing is following him. We're not just believing these things. I'm following you. I'm I'm walking with you. I'm walking beside you. And I'm doing what you've given me to do. Wherever you lead me, wherever you've sent me, wherever you put me, I believe that I'm following in your footsteps in that place. And I thank you, Lord. And what is it that you've given me to do here? Because if not, all this stuff means nothing. If it's not the person in front of me, the situation that I am, that being worked out, the gospel produces this in me. Doesn't give me, get me closer to God, doesn't improve my standing, doesn't get me to a higher level of heaven or a bigger mansion or anything like that. Simply what the gospel was doing in my heart. I've got a little clip from another preacher because you hear enough of my voice. Uh, an evangelist uh, who, who I think says this better than, than anyone else. Uh, let me just play that and you can hear what he has to say uh, on this idea. I don't ask people if they're saved anymore. Who isn't saved? From the White House to the jailhouse. <clears throat> I look a person in the eye and say, does Christ live in you? I was saying, it, I didn't ask you that. I'm asking you, is Christ, does Christ live in you? Christianity is the only religion in the world where a man's God comes and lives inside of him. A Chinese scholar was given a copy of the New Testament. He'd read the Quran, he'd read the Vedas and all the sacred books. The man said to him, did you read the New Testament through? He said, I did. What's the most amazing thing? He thought the man would say, the most amazing thing I read was that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. That he died and physically rose again from the dead. Instead of that, he said, the most awesome thing is in Philippians chapter 2, or Ephesians chapter 2. It is, yes. It says, in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And then at the end of that same chapter, it says, you are the habitation of God. He said, sir, does your God live inside of you? If so, that's the most awesome thing I've read. And I've read the Quran, I've read the Vedas, I've read all those other sacred books. But I never read where a man's God comes and makes the man the habitation of God. of all the things that Christ is in you the hope of glory all these beliefs, all these things that we hold to if it isn't a walk with Jesus if it isn't his life in me then it's, it's, it's just empty it's, it's belief, it's, it's something it's perhaps head knowledge but to live that out so our fundamental number 10 none of these things matter unless they are lived out in a walk with Jesus all these things and they are wonderful things and they will impact and they will shape your life and the more you dwell on them you'll find more application and basically that's all that our gatherings are they are working out what is the application of these things and what are the, what are the ways that these impact us and that's what discipleship is it's a daily going how does the, these truths how do they impact the way I treat them and respond to this and react to that and it's allowing it to go deeper and deeper into us There is a deeper in faith, but it's not a deeper out there. It's a deeper in me. It's giving more of myself. Paul says it like this. I no longer live, but I've been crucified with Christ. And it's Christ who lives in me. I'm more of myself who goes and Christ lives in me. As I do that, I live out these things and they make a difference. They change my life. They change other people's lives. And it's not really about am I saved. We can all talk about the time where it first dawned on us. Where we first grasped something and something happened and, and I was connected. But the real question is, does Christ dwell in me today? Am I walking with him today? Maybe for however long, I think for me, probably the first five years of my life, I was a believer in Jesus. And then it dawned on me that I should be also a follower of Jesus. 
And I want to invite you today, I don't know how long perhaps you would call yourself a believer and you've been a believer 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I want to invite you today to become a follower of Jesus. A follower who walks with him. All these truths shape you and impact you, but they do so as you walk alongside him. Because the danger is in our faith is that we want heaven and we want blessing and we want grace and we want forgiveness and we want life. And we want healing and we want encouragement. But none of those things exist outside of Jesus. In him is hope. In him is peace. In him is healing. In him is forgiveness. In him is encouragement and all that we want. And so it's only as I walk with him that these things are mine. Because he is mine and I am his. So number 10, like I said, perhaps the most important because otherwise we're just like Satan. We believe these things, we hold them to be true, but none of them matter unless they are lived out in a walk with Jesus. They do shape you and the more you think about them, they shape how you treat others, how you think about yourself, how you live, how you handle your money, how you treat your, your children and your family, how you, how you treat your church, how you treat your community, how you treat nature. All these things get shaped, but not if they stay in our heads. You have hands and feet, and we are those who dwell, Christ dwells in. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And so I invite you, in a moment, we're going to take communion. Which of all the things it is, it's a reminder of what Jesus done. But it's also, if you think about it, you take it and you eat it. And the bread and the wine become a part of you. They become the energy that energizes you. They become a source of life in you. They do something just on the physical side, but it's a symbolic picture. Christ in me is as I take him, as he becomes part of me, as, I, as he dwells in my heart, that the truth of these things are lived out. So we're going to start by singing a song as we prepare ourselves to, to receive this meal as a reminder. I think it's you are my vision, is that right? And we fix our eyes on Jesus. As we send to them on him, the king of my heart. That's what it is. I give you my heart. You're my king. Nothing else will satisfy. Only you. Let's sing together before we share communion. <laughs>